study session. So welcome uh, everyone to Wednesday's session. I had the pleasure to introduce uh, Sam Statton, which is our invited speaker today. Sam is uh, currently professor of computer science in Oxford. Uh, his work has studied uh, several aspects in the theory of programming languages, uh, but in particular has done a really groundbreaking work uh, to develop uh, the semantics of probabilistic programming languages. And the talk today will uh, be on formal structures for probabilistic computation. Thanks, Claudia. Yeah, so I've taken the title from the conference, but I'm going to talk about probability uh, rather than uh, computation and deduction. Sorry, I'll just close my... Um, so what I wanna do in this talk is to sort of start from a little language, a little library I've been working on over the last few um, years, a couple of years maybe, just bringing together ideas from other people's, oops, other people's systems. Uh, it's called Lazy People. You can go away and have a go with it on, on Bitbucket if you want. Um, but you know, I want to look at it from the semantic point of view. And one of the reasons I put this together is that I found I couldn't find a combination of these languages, although they're really great, that had all of these ideas inside it. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, yeah, but the question I want to address is what is a sound semantic model for lazy people? That's the little language here. And I think as well as suggesting you know, the importance of semantic models for, for, for verifying program transformations and so on. It's also interesting in its own right and perhaps suggests new formal structures in probability. And I'll talk about some of these things during the talk as well. Uh, just to take a step back and talk sort of philosophically, uh, when we talk to high school students about programming, maybe something we say is that there are low level, there's low level programming and high level programming and low level programming is useful for reasons uh, and high level programming is useful for other reasons. Um, and I think it's important to have this, uh, to have both of these views for, for, for two reasons. One being engineering, you know, software engineering with high level functions is, is much better. And secondly, being foundational, we know that the high level structures, higher order functions and so on, have a Curry Howard correspondence with natural deduction. And that's crucially important and fascinating foundationally. Um, at the low level, we can also discuss engineering and foundational questions like complexity theoretic questions. Um, and I want to also sort of frame probability theory in this way. At the low level in probability, maybe you're a subjective Bayesian and you're interested in bets, or maybe you're interested in frequencies or decisions on the philosophical foundational side, or maybe you're an engineer and you want to run Monte Carlo simulations at a low level. But there's also a high level where we want to talk about more abstract structures and symmetries and, and so on of those. Um, one area that's focused on a lot in the probability theory literature over the last hundred years or so is infinite dimensional systems like stochastic processes. And I'll talk a bit about that. But I think there's a lot of other stuff to explore in terms of the high level compositional structure of probability, which I think we in the FSCD community have something to contribute. So um, let me press on with looking at this kind of thing. I'll be focusing at a high level, um, trying to understand lazy people, perhaps with statistical applications, but also as a sort of fundamental question of what is a structure for prob probability. So let me look at some simple high level probabilistic programs to get started and illustrate the sorts of things I'm talking about. The first one I want to look at is random linear functions. So this doesn't really exhibit any of the interesting stuff uh, at, at all to start with, but we'll start, I want to sort of build it up. So here I have a little program. It's written in, 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 in the language, in Lazy People, which is a Haskell library. Um, and what it does is, I'll just read it through. We draw an A and a B from normal distributions. And then we want to think of the A and B as the parameters of a linear function. A linear function has a slope and an intercept, a line, and we want to say what, and if we have A and B, that parameterizes a linear function. If you've forgotten what a normal distribution is, I've, I've plotted the curve down here, right? So roughly, it's gonna be roughly zero that we get. It could be anything, you know, it could be minus a hundred or a thousand or whatever, but, but it's uh, normally distributed, A and B. Okay. So I wanna think of those as a linear function. The reason I wanna do that perhaps 
I'll talk about this a bit more later, is that we want to solve a regression problem. Maybe we've got some data points and we want to figure out which function probably generated those points. And in order to solve a regression problem in the Bayesian way, we need to start out with a prior on the kinds of functions that are allowed around at all. Okay, so I'll come back to that, but let's just talk about this function a little bit more, this random linear function. And as I said, I'm returning an A and a B. Well, Haskell has a genuine function type, so we ought to really use that rather than returning the slope and the intercept separately. Um, so we'll come to that in a second, but first let me just show you, you know, this is what the A and the B look like, uh, two, a 2D uh, normal distribution. Right, if I want to now replace it with a, a genuine function type, I just write this program here. I return fx is ax plus b. And now I'm returning f, which is no longer a pair of numbers, an A and a slope and an intercept, but rather the actual linear function. So I plotted here 10,000 samples and perhaps gives you a better idea of what I mean by linear function when you, when you see the lines here rather than the dots, which are the slope and the intercept. Um, maybe that doesn't come across very well in Zoom. So I just sampled 100 here and you can see these lines going off any which way. Um, if we want to be doing Bayesian regression, we often want to start with a fairly uninformative prior, that's to say the lines are going everywhere, and then constrain it afterwards. And so uh, hopefully you can see these are, this is a fairly uninformative prior. Let me talk though a little bit, probably you're interested to know a little bit about how the regression works. What I want to do though in this talk is really to, to, to dwell and focus on probabilistic models rather than inference and regression and Bayesian statistics. But I'll just say a few words just to just maybe satisfy your curiosity. And I'm happy to talk about that more, this more later. Okay. So in lazy people, as well as defining this random linear function, I can also define a regression function. Um, uh, and uh, in, uh, there's a bill, I've, I've defined a, a metropolis Hastings method in lazy people. It's about 20 lines of, of code, which you can go away. I, I've tried to write it clearly as a way of understanding Metropolis Hastings, if, if you want to understand it for the first time. Um, but two things to say about Bayesian regression. Um, the first one is it's not giving us a line of best fit through these points. Rather, it's giving us a distribution on lines. And that's really the beauty of Bayesian statistics. It doesn't just try and boil everything down to one answer, but rather a probability distribution. So you can see starting from this uninformative prior, the regression has given us this distribution on, on posterior functions uh, which is much more informative. Um, the second thing I want to say is that obviously these points are not collinear, so there's no line that perfectly fits them. And so the way to deal with that in Bayesian regression is to say, well, actually, they must be noisy observations about a genuine linear function. And so I'm passing in, I won't go through all this code, but I'm passing in to the regression function a sigma, which is the amount of noise, the standard deviation for the amount of noise that, 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 that's happening in the measurements of the linear function. And then regress also takes in a random function, a probability distribution over functions such as random linear, and we'll look at some more examples in a second, and a data set. Okay. And then it gives us this posterior distribution over functions. But let's come back to the random linear function and look a little bit more at what language features are inside here and what we, if, if I want to give a semantic model, what I need to explain. So first up, there's a type constructor, right? We've got this space of functions from reals to reals, but this isn't returning a deterministic function from reals to reals. It's returning something in prob real arrow real, okay? And prob, it turns out, takes for any type A, we can form prob A. I'm not going to show you how prob is implemented uh, because I want to more give across an intuition as to what prob does, um, you know, in terms of spaces and so on. Well, what's in here? Well, prob, first of all, is a monad. If you know about monad, that's great. If you don't know about monads, probably doesn't matter too much. But basically, it means we can sequence together things in order to get uh, uh, to build up new distributions. Um, so, for example, prob real num contains probability distributions such as the normal distributions that we've talked about. These two here will be in prob real num. Prob ball is also there. And that contains things like coin tosses, where we either return true or false, a fair coin toss we often call Bernoulli 0.5. So that's there. But I think as we start to apply this constructor to other types, we start to see some interesting structure, which tells us something about the kinds of spaces and the kinds of probabilities we might want to talk about. So normal on its own 
takes two parameters, zero and three. Normal is actually a function which takes two deterministic parameters, the mean and the standard deviation, and produces a probability measure on the real numbers. So it's a parameterized distribution, and you can read that off from the type. Same as Bernoulli, it takes a bias for a coin, and it returns a probability distribution on the booleans. Okay. Um, yeah, so parameterized distributions are things like this. But we can also, by putting the prob constructor in different places, see other structures. So prob real arrow real, and now I've pulled the prob to the outside, is a different kettle of fish. It contains random functions like rand linear. Let me just talk through why I think this program has worked. It does have type prob real arrow real. Okay, first of all, I draw from this normal distribution, which you just said is a prob real. And when we draw this left arrow will give us back a real. Okay, so A is a real number, B is a real number. F is a function from reals to reals, right? F yeah, is a function from reals to reals, a, a deterministic plane Haskell function from reals to reals. But the whole thing, when we wrap it up in this do block, which includes sampling the A and the B is a probability measure on that space of the return value F, okay? So the whole program is a probability measure, a, prob a random function. Okay. I'll talk about some other examples of random functions in a second. I just want to mention one other thing we can do with a type constructor is that we can say prob prob bool or prob prob a more generally. And I'll come to that at the end of the talk. It's really, really useful in Bayesian statistics to have a belief about uncertainty. Okay, so layering up the monad in this way, prob, prob bool, is really interesting and important. Okay, so, you know, I've been talking about types and I haven't shown you the implementation and rather I want you to start thinking of these things as spaces. And we'll come to that in a second as we build the quasi Borel space model of lazy people and we see that these things, these types and type constructors can really be understood as spaces. Let me just show you a couple more examples of uh, random functions first though. Um, taking a step back, Haskell is uh, obviously a, you know, a plain, a, a useful functional language apart from lazy people. And the kind of thing you might do in a first or second year course on functional programming is to define an evaluator for arithmetic expressions. So here I've just written down one of these kinds of grammar for that you might have for a simple arithmetic language. It's a little bit interesting. It's got an if then else construct in it. And then an evaluator that just works by paths and matching. And so uh, what we could then do is define a random expression, which randomly generates an expression by picking randomly, whether it's going to have an add and then a multiply or an if then and then an add and then a multiply over here and so on. And it could do that as a co probabilistic context free grammar. That's what I've done. But you, there are perhaps other ways of doing it as well. I won't show you the code, uh, but then we generate a random program, a random function by first sampling an expression from this probability measure over the space of expressions, and then not returning the expression, but returning the evaluator for that expression, which is a function from reals to reals. So now, because this is a random function, I can pass it into my regression thing, function, my second regression is a sort of second order thing in that it takes a random function as an argument. Um, and we end up with this. I've only, rather than like 10,000 draws, this time I've only done three draws because it's very multimodal and the draws all look very different. And you can see for the purple line, for example, it's, it's decided to do an if then else at this point, it's a constant up to about three and then an if then else, and then a linear function for a bit, and then an if then else, and then another linear function. And it's come up with all sorts of other examples as well. You can see perhaps if it's not too small, you can see the program code that it's found at the bottom here. So I think lazy people is a, really a prototype language. I think it's, you're limited how far you could push this kind of program synthesis at this point, but it's, uh, it's, it's very, um, I think, exciting. One other kind of function which lies inside the space of random functions is the Gaussian process, uh, the Wiener distribution or Brownian motion. I won't show you the code for this, um, but I, it, because it lives in the space of random functions, I can pass it into my regression method as well. And it gives me back Gaussian process regression. If you don't know much about Brownian motion or you can't remember, roughly what it's saying is that the, uh, um, it, it, it's giving a random function that's almost surely nowhere smooth, but everywhere continuous. So it's jumping about like crazy. And as you zoom in, you see it jumping about even more. Okay, so it's really a fascinating thing to experiment with. 
So that gives you some ex idea of the kinds of random function that are around inside the kinds of language that I want to think about. And now we can start looking at semantic models. Okay, so what we want to do is find a semantic model that supports all of these kinds of things, right? Um, and I'm gonna tell you about the model of quasi virile spaces, which we've been working on for the last uh, four or five years. So to lead up to quasi virile spaces, I'm gonna tell you about a lemma, which is a crucial lemma in probability. Probably many of you know it or by other names or by this name. I'm gonna call it the randomization lemma. And it says that for any probability, to, to, to sample from any probability measure on a large number of different spaces, all you need is one uniform distribution. A uniform distribution on the unit interval is enough to generate all kinds of randomness that you probably need. Okay, so let me spell it out in sort of programming terms. It says that for any probability measure P, there is a real, a, fun, a, a deterministic function alpha from the reals to B, right? B is the space where P is the distribution over. And then a probabilist would write something like this, or oh, sorry, that F should be an alpha. P is uh, distributed as alpha of the uniform distribution. In programming terms, we can write it like this. P is the same as drawing something from a uniform distribution and then returning, not returning that draw R, but returning alpha R, where alpha is this function that we're pushing down. So you might think of it as uh, this R is a seed of randomness. And from there, we generate all the random choices. Um, and that's that's that, that's fine. So let me give an example just to uh, remind you. Oh, let me, the first let me say about parameter, the parameterized version, because if you want to really understand it, I, I guess you should understand the parameterized version, which says that if I have a parameterized distribution, like the normal distribution, which takes a mean and a standard deviation, you can find a normal, you can find a parameterized uh, function, uh, which is taking that extra argument A and then giving back a function from reals to B. Okay, and then I'm just passing the parameter around. Let me give you an example, though, uh, which inside the program we were talking about, we were sampling from normal zero three. So how do I do that with a uniform draw? Well, one way is to uh, use this um, so-called inverse probit function to so we draw from the uniform distribution that gives us a number between zero and one. And then we look it up in this function and that gives us a number between minus infinity and infinity. And as we do that, lots and lots of times we'll end up with the normal distribution over here. OK. So I've rotated that on the side if, that, if that's unclear. Okay, so to simulate a normal distribution, it's enough to sample from a uniform distribution and then apply this function to the cum inverse uh, cumulative distribution function is another name for it to the result. So that works for the normal distribution, which is a distribution on the reals, but actually you can do a, a, a similar trick for a distribution on, on the space of pairs of reals as well on the plane, um, which I won't go into now. Okay, but the, the uniform distribution is, is enough as a seed of randomness for everything. Um, so that takes us to, that, that's what I want to take rather than as a lemma, as an axiom for quasi borel spaces, more or less. I mean, I'm being a bit casual, but let me tell you what a quasi borel space is. So a quasi borel space, sort of building in this lemma as, as our motivation is a set, X, together with a collection set of ran admissible random elements or functions that were alphas that were allowed to use to push forward the, uh, the, the uniform distribution onto the space X. Okay, so it might be that we include inside M the uh, inverse CDF for the normal distribution, for example, in, to en enable us to, to do that. Okay, so quasi borel space is a set X equipped together with a collection of admitted random elements. Um, I should tell you what we're going to do with quasi borel spaces. We're going to interpret the types of the language, which are so far just syntactic types, as quasi borel spaces. So they're going to come equipped with one of these M's. And the programs, and the functions in our language, are going to be interpreted as morphisms between quasi borel spaces, which are just functions that preserve this M structure. So if I have a, an ad admitted random element in X, then when I compose it with our morphism f, it should give me an admitted random element in y. That's the condition for a morphism. So this is reminiscent to various things that we talk about 
uh, in uh, other parts of computation and deduction, I suppose. Uh, one is that it looks a bit like a logical relation. Well, it is a logical relation. I haven't, I mean, I, I'm going to ask that it satisfies some other conditions that I haven't told you about, but it, it, a logical relation, normally you would put two here. You would have a, bin a, a binary relation. This is an uncountable array relation. Um, uh, uh, so that's, that's that. And then this notion of function is just a function preserving the relation. Um, another thing it's similar to and why we called it quasi borel space, it's very similar to quasi-topological spaces, if you've ever come across those. It's a very nice class of spaces that are a bit like topological spaces, which are called quasi-topological spaces. Um, and indeed, those form a quasi-topos, a concrete quasi-topos, and quasi borel spaces do as well. So they have a lot of lovely structure. If you don't know about that, that's fine. I'm not going to talk much more about it, but, but that's there, a lot of lovely structure. So that's what a space is. It's a set together with a class of admitted, admitted random elements in that set, things that we can use, alphas we can use to generate probability measures. So what is a probability measure on a quasi borel space? Well, it's just a function, an admitted random element, just a function in MX, an alpha that we're allowed to use. Um, one subtle point though, which is very important, is that different alphas will give rise to the same probability measure. Okay. So, for example, I've just been talking about this one that allows us to build the normal distribution. We could flip it around, and if I calculate, yeah, that will give us the same distribution. So, different random elements will give the same distribution. So, we need to work modulo an equivalence relation. So, I'll tell you what that equivalence relation is now. But before I tell you about the equivalence relation, I ought to tell you what's the space of real numbers, because that was really important in all the examples we've done. And it's going to be important in understanding this equivalence on probability measures. So the quasi borel space of reals is just the set of real numbers. And I need to tell you what's M, what are the admitted random elements? And the admitted random elements are not all the functions from reals to reals, at least in classical ZFC, it's going to be the Borel functions. And these are the functions, if you don't know about measure theory and so on, that's fine. These are just functions that admit a good notion of integration. So these functions from R to R that we're allowed, we'll, we'll allow are the functions that allow integration so that we can talk about expected values. And we're going to talk about expected values in understanding when two measures are the same. Two measures are equal, I'll say alpha is equal to beta. If for all morphisms from X to R, so the measures are on space X, and if for all morphisms from X to the reals, morphism has to preserve the structure, right? then the expected value that comes from composing alpha with k is the same as the expected value that comes from composing beta with k. So if I've got a measure on x given by an alpha, a random element, and I've got a function into the reals, I might want to say, well, what's the expected value of k right, given the measure alpha? And to find that out, all we do is compose alpha and k. That's now a function from reals to reals, so we know how to integrate it. And so we just say that those two integrals have to be the same, those two expected values. We can put it another way, which is in more programming terms. I'm gonna form the space of all probability measures as the set of functions, sort of expectation computers. And these are things that given a function from a morphism from X to the reals, give us back a real. I'm not gonna allow all of those functions from X to R to R, but only the ones that come from a random element. Okay. Uh, there's a reason for that, why I'm restricting it, and I'll explain that in a second. Okay. But really it's, so if you know about continuations, this is the continuation monad, but we don't take the full continuation monad, we take the continuation monad generated by uh, the admitted random elements. And so this is a wonderful, this notion of probability works extremely well, and it's been uh, used by us several times and by other people as well. Okay, so just to sum up then, we're going to interpret types as quasi borel spaces. Space is equipped with a collection of admitted random elements. The real numbers are going to be the quasi borel space of real numbers, together with the Borel functions. The probability measures on a space A are going to be the, uh, these expectation calculators, these probability measures that come from admitted random elements on A. So that's quasi borel spaces. And the category of quasi borel spaces is Cartesian closed, so we can interpret all the types we've been talking about, function spaces, product types, also co-product types, Booleans, and so on, everything's there. Um, oh yes, uh, just as an aside, I mean, I didn't want to talk too much about implementation, but 
I use this kind of idea in my implementation of lazy people, but rather than using the reals as a source of randomness, I found it helpful to use a different space, which is isomorphic, like Borel isomorphic, uh, but, diff but sort of more more elaborate. And that's the space of sort of reals, uh, the infinite tuples of reals, R to the omega to the omega. Um, and that allows us to always be able to peel off a fresh real choice and get another, at any point, get hold of an infinite sequence of these, I think of them as trees. Okay, um, I, I'm happy to explain that a little bit more. By the way, I wonder where omega to the omega is coming from because it's so useful perhaps because statistical models only use kind of primitive recursion or something like that, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so that's quasi real spaces. Let me talk, I'm gonna talk about why they work well, but before I do that, I, I, I wanna talk abstractly about what we might expect a good model of lazy people of probability to satisfy. And that's the data flow property. It's a property that we know from compilers, um, but it also corresponds to Fabini's theorem in, prob in probability and measure, and it corresponds to the interchange law in monoidal categories. Um, let me show you what it says. It says, uh, if, uh, it says if I've got this program, which we've already seen, where I draw A and then I draw B, I can reorder the lines so that I first draw B and then I draw A. And these two programs will behave in the same way. Now, if these programs involved side effects like state, like memory effects, in general, you wouldn't be able to reorder the lines of a program. But I'm gonna say a program or a programming language or a library has a data flow property if program lines can be reordered and, we can, and, and, and discarded, I'll come to that in a second. We can view that this sort of diagrammatically by looking at the data flow graph, which also looks like a multi-category. Um, and it says, you know, we've got the normal here and then we're normal here for B and we put A and B together to get out an F, and it's the same as doing it the other way around. So when we look at the data flow graph, in other words, we can do topological manipulations on the data flow graph without changing the meaning. Yeah, let me say about discarding as well. So suppose I introduced an extra C, then, um, uh, you know, and didn't use it. Well, that's not gonna change the meaning of the program at all either. Okay, so we can view that over here, like there's a little bit of the thing which doesn't tie onto anything else, and we can throw that way. I mentioned Fabini, let me talk about that. So here, these programs can be described, uh, could be thought of as describing measures. I've talked about quasi borel spaces, but if that was a bit too recent, then maybe you can see intuitively what's going on. What we want to do is we want to return an F, but then we want to think of that in terms of what happens next. What Maybe we want to calculate the expected value of, of some K. And so what we would do then is we would integrate with respect to all the random choices, A and B, right? So the meaning of this program, one way to see it, going back, I guess, to Dexter Cozen's work on probabilistic programming, although maybe not with higher order functions there, is that the meaning of this program is an, ex is an expectation calculator like this. And the point is that we can reorder the A and the B just as we can reorder integrals. Well, we can't always reorder integrals, but we can reorder integrals over probability spaces. And that's what's going on here. So this is Fabini's theorem, now viewed abstractly as a criterion on uh, data flow, on, on program transformations. Again, you know, this thing here, it's about marginalizing an unused variable. And the fact that these two are equal is, again, a standard thing you would calculate with basic measure theory. quasi borel spaces do satisfy this data flow property. We can prove that whenever we interpret programs in quasi borel spaces, even if they use higher order functions and everything else, they will always satisfy this data flow property. We can always reorder lines and discard unused lines. And this whole idea has been taken as a, 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 by, by other people as an abstract setting for probability. We say that what we really should be looking at is just an arbitrary monad that's commutative and affine. This is sort of approach taken by Anders Koch and other people. Another perspective, which is equivalent, is to say what we should really be looking at is monoidal categories, semi-Cartesian or affine monoidal categories. Um, and then there's been a lot, some exciting recent work where, where Tobias Fritz and, and others have managed to prove very interesting results based on uh, just from that perspective of semi-Cartesian monoidal categories. Okay, so that gives it like an abstract view of maybe what we'd like to have for higher or a higher level probabilistic programming as a theory, as an underlying notion of space 
If nothing else, we'd like to have the data flow property and quasi Borel spaces are a candidate for that. And I'm gonna to push to places where quasi Borel spaces can't reach in a second. So I'm gonna to move to some open problems. So I called my language lazy people, but I haven't really talked very much about laziness so far. Uh, let me come to start talking about that now. I'm gonna talk about laziness and point processes. A point process on a space, this is a concept from probability and statistics, is a probability measure on the space of bags over that space, or the probability measure on the space of lists over that space or streams over that space. There's a bit of variation in how we think of it. So I'm going to write this prob A in square brackets in Haskell. If you don't know Haskell in square, Haskell, we write square brackets to mean finite or infinite lists. Let me give you an example, and then I'll talk about how they're useful more generally. Here's a point process on the positive reals. It's the Poisson point process. I drew six draws from the Poisson point process. One, two, three, four, five, six. And each time it's giving us points uh, in, in the positive reals. Um, what do I want to say? Yeah, maybe you've seen Poisson distributions in high school, but you haven't seen Poisson point processes. So Poisson distributions tell us how many points are in each area, right, in each unit. Um, and uh, I've chosen this, so there should be on average two. Sometimes you talk about when buses arrive or when telephone calls come in, or more, more interestingly, you might say when coronavirus cases occur. And so, and, um, so, so this is telling you not how many, but when they happen. That's what the point process does. Now, one way to generate a point, a Poisson point process has lots of characterizations. It's a beautiful thing. Um, but one way to generate it is by noticing that the gaps between points in the Poisson process are exponentially distributed, the gaps between them. So exponential distribution looks something like this. This is exponential distribution with rate two. And so the uh, gap between points is exponentially distributed. So we would what we would do to find out the gap between, so supposing we're here to find out where to go next, we would draw from the exponential distribution and we would uh, see where to end up. Okay, and that would tell us this gap. And so that's all I've done is just keep drawing from the exponential distribution to figure out different gaps and then add them all together to get a, a point process, a sequence of numbers. And I can write that in lazy people. Um, we go through and we draw from the exponential distribution we then say, well, we were starting from lower. Now let's add that step to lower to get our X. And then we sample the whole of the rest of the thing. And we cons, we put our X at the front of the stream. Now this is giving us an infinite stream. The Poisson process goes on forever across all the real numbers, a positive real numbers. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so there's laziness coming in here and in, into how we deal with that. It's an infinite, it's a distribution over infinite bags. I'm not sure what infinite bags means perhaps, but infinite streams, but it's lazy, lazily evaluated, which means that in order to plot these pictures here, I didn't have to do anything very special in lazy people. I just, because the viewport ends here, the plotting, I just plotted between zero and five. It, it, the laziness just dealt with everything else. I was quite pleased with how well the laziness of Haskell interacted with this kind of laziness that you, you might want to have in stochastic processes and probability. Before, I want to show you an example of something you might do with Poisson point process, but they arrive ev rise everywhere across science, machine learning, you know, ecology, uh, astronomy, epidemiology, everything. And also they play a fundamental role, I think, in the theory of statistics or at least of non-parametric statistics. A recent idea which I found quite exciting is that point processes could be thought of as generalized probabilistic databases. So a database is just a bag of tuples. A random database should just be a random bag of tuples. And uh, by thinking of them as point processes, we can start to expand what we think of as probabilistic databases. This is a line of work taken by Martin Groher and Peter Lindner, and I've been looking at it with Swaraj um, as well. So something we might want to do just, I, I mean, I could typically what you do with point processes is try and find out what the rate is or something. Um, but I, I wanted to just keep it to this regression example. So what we might, what I thought we could do is do a piecewise constant regression. So I'm trying to find a piecewise constant step staircase, or not necessarily always going up, but something going uh, piecewise constant to fit these 
points. Um, a, a constant function, a random constant function, is like a random linear function. It's just that it doesn't have a slope. It just has an intercept. Okay, so we draw an A and then we, we return A. And then I don't think I want to go over the code of, of this, but we, I've defined a splice function that takes a point process and a random function and then splices them together to get back a random function. And then I used that in this regression and that's how we ended up with this uh, posterior distribution over the kinds of lines that might fit. I've seen this kind of thing used in uh, maybe modeling neurons that you want to see uh, which energy levels they're at or something. Um, an interesting point here though is that the simulation is un unsure whether there's one change point just happening here or two change points, one happening around this region between the third and fourth points, and then another one between the third, uh, fourth and fifth points. Okay, So the dimension of the, the thing is changing as we don't run the simulation. We're exploring different possible numbers of uh, uh, change points. Um, another thing I want to say is that Haskell's lazy. I've already said this once, but I'll say it again. So the simulation only looks at the viewport. And as, as I start expanding the viewport, the simulation has to carry on and explore different other random choices. So within the, the viewport up to about seven, it's the function is fairly constrained by the data point. This is, we've done regression here, the regression. And so it's constrained by the data points. But once there's no more data points around, we're just using the Poisson process and piecewise constant functions to build up a, a, a random function and so we see it starts to just jump about all over the place, okay, as we go along. So we could keep on going forever. This is a random function that keeps jumping around forever, um, but there's no worry about um, uh, sort of termination because everything fits in, which Haskell's being lazy and only worrying about what it needs to know. So in statistics, often what you would have to do is explicitly truncate your description of your system, explicitly truncate it at seven or wherever you're interested in. Um, and late, I, think, I think it's beautiful that laziness is taking care of that for us to some extent. Um, so that's what I want to say about laziness and point processes. I want to finish up, though, by talking about um, stochastic memoization. And that's something that goes beyond laziness. So I'll remind you about memoization. Like me probably many of you worked on the memoization more than me. Um, memoization, the basic idea is that when you're running, a, so it's nothing to do with probability. When you're running a function, you, re you record, you remember the results of prior calls. So you only compute an argument when you get a fresh argument. Otherwise, you just remember what happened before. So for example, square of 57, I calculate that's three, two, four, nine. Uh, then square of three is nine. And then somebody says square of 57. I don't have to recalculate that. I can look it up in my memo table and return 3249 already. Okay, then carries on. People can ask for other square numbers. Uh, and uh, a bit of the history. Brian Mitchie came up with this, I think, uh, six, 1968. And he, he called the paper Memo Functions and Machine Learning. Uh, his idea was that this is capturing rote learning, the kind of thing that uh, school students are expected to do when they're learning multiplication tables and so on. Um, so although it's called machine learning, there's nothing random going on in, in, in his, well, at least in the first part of his paper. Um, rather, it's, I think, a variation on laziness. We're being lazy about, uh, about recalculating the values of functions. So with pure functions, as he said, it doesn't change the semantics. It's just a speed up. With impure functions, in particular, I'm interested in functions with probability, it changes the semantics. So we wouldn't naively do it. We, shouldn't, we should be careful about doing it. But actually, I think it changes the semantics in a really interesting way, and it's a really useful thing to do. And it's a really useful way of building infinite dimensional structures. So this idea of stochastic memoization is, I think, due to these guys from back in 2008, 2009, um, yeah, but, but I've been looking at what does it mean on the type side and what does it mean on the model side. So I'll tell you a bit about uh, some developments there. But to that, let's come back to this Poisson process example. And I want to rewrite it in a way that's maybe more, uh, that, that demonstrates memoization starting to happen. So here's my rewritten program. It's two lines short of the kind of thing that used to really annoy me when Haskell programmers used to do it. Uh, but let me talk you through it. So I've introduced this new function called memlist, right? But I'll tell you about that in a second. First of all, 
I take this function, this, this uh, con con construction exponential rate, which is a, the name of a probability measure on the reals. And then I call repeat, which means make an infinite stream, which just literally says exp exp exponential, 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 exponential forever. Okay. So that's not done anything. It's just made an infinite, well, it's just made an infinite stream of the word exponential rate. Now, that's a, then a list or a stream of distributions. And what MemList does is to convert that into a distribution over streams. And how does it do it? Well, it draws one thing and then draws the whole rest of the stream and then appends the first thing onto the rest. This is called sequence in Haskell. And provided we do it lazily, it, it all works fine. Okay. So when I call MemList with this thing, it turns this stream of distributions into a distribution of streams, and we then get hold of the gaps in the point process. Okay, it's drawn from every one of those things, hopefully lazily, to get back the gaps that we're going to have between the things by drawing from all of those exponential distributions. Now, those are the gaps to get back the actual Poisson point process. We need to add, uh, keep a running total of where we're at, and that's what scan list does if you know about that. Okay, and that gives us these coordinates for the red dots that are here. So it's a way of rewriting a Poisson point process using memlist. Okay. An open problem is whether quasi borel spaces support this construction memlist over streams. Over finite lists, it's fine. And also over when A is the real numbers or the Booleans, as it often is, it's all fine. But the question is whether it supports this in general. And I don't know the answer to that. So we don't know whether we have a model of this kind of co-inductive functionality yet. Um, oh, if you're interested in monads, you might spot a distributive law happening here, and that's a distributive law that, that lots of people have looked at recently for various reasons, um, and it's uh, very exciting if you're into it. Okay. Um, now let me take a slightly different view on this memlist function. So it's taking a stream of probabilities to a probability of streams, but we could equivalently think of a stream as a function from the integers to the space of probabilities or of the natural numbers, you know, zero is going to tell us the first thing in the stream, one, it's going to tell us the second thing in the stream, three, it's going to tell, the two, it's going to tell us the second thing in the stream. Oh, I've got out by, by zero, haven't I? Zero is going to tell us the first thing in the stream, one is going to tell us the second thing in the stream, two is going to tell us the third thing in the stream, and so on. So, if, I mean, there's issues perhaps about beta and eta equivalents and so on, but roughly we can view a stream as a function from natural numbers or integers to the space. And so what MemoWise is then doing is converting a function from integers to prob A to a random function from integers to A. It's converting one of these parameterized probability measures into a random function. I put, if you're interested, the code that we might use to do that, but I want to talk more generally now about this memoization construction. So MemoWise, I don't just want to think about for when, when the domain of the function is the integers, but when it's an arbitrary type, A, okay. A. We need to know a little bit about the type. We need to be able to compare the type uh, elements for equality in order to, for this to make sense, I think. Um, but basically what MemoWise does is we want to think of it as randomly pick from Px. Px is a probability measure on B. We want to make a random choice for every x. And then that gives us a function from A to B. That, that assignment gives us a function from A to B. And we want to return that assignment, having made all of those random choices. Problem is, when A is infinite, especially uncountably infinite, then it's very difficult to, to do that all in one go. And so what we can do practically is return a random function that keeps a secret memo table. Right, so when we call F3, it's going to be a different memo table this time. Then what we do is we call P3, the parameterized probability distribution, that does some randomness, and maybe it gives us back 23.6. Okay. Then I call, someone calls F with, with 57. I'm gonna call P with 57, that gives us some other random number, 17.5. Someone comes back and says, what's F of three? And now in stochastic memoization, I don't recalculate, I don't regenerate a new random number. Rather, I look in the memo table and I see I've got 23.6 here. And so I return 23.6 again. Okay. And we can carry on, you know, this whole thing keeps going for, for forever, but well, for as long as it runs. So by keeping a memo table, we can describe a memoized 
random function and the types are explaining what happens with the effects. Okay, it was not when we memorize something with effects, it changes the behavior, but we can still do it. Okay, let me show you how it's implemented in Haskell very briefly. You know, I've had to keep a, a hidden table here. So I'm using some IO refs, some, some looking, looking up in tables and so on and so forth. One thing you might wonder then if I'm using IO under the hood, I'm using memory under the hood is whether we still have this data flow property. And my conjecture is that stochastic memoization is, is safe in that it preserves the data flow property. That property that we thought was a fundamental property for statistics and probability, even at a high level, still seems to hold, even if you use a little bit of memory in implementing your stochastic memoization. And I'd really like to prove that. Um, but to prove that, I guess, one way to prove it would be to find a model. Maybe you can think of other ways to prove it. I'd be very interested to hear that. So let me tell you a bit about work, work uh, towards finding a model, which I think is quite exciting. Oh, sorry, before I do that, I want to tell you why it's, why it's get a little bit more of a hint why it's important. Okay, so it comes up a lot in clustering. Suppose we've got some points and we want to cluster them according to their position. And we don't know how many clusters there are and so on. Then what you might do is you might color them. And you, so then when we're coloring the points, we can say, what's the proportion of points of each color? And we can represent that as a probability measure on colors. I haven't talked about memoization yet, but I'm getting there. Okay. So we could talk about the number of points or the proportion of points with each color. And we're trying to figure that out. Well, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out. Now, because there's some uncertainty involved, we don't really know what the clusters are, right? It could be that that's a good clustering. It could be that this is a good clustering and so forth. So what we really have is not a probability measure on colors, but a random probability measure on colors, which says what could be, what, what's the distribution on proportions of points of each color. So here you have this prob prob construction coming up really naturally. And what we, what, what we might want to do then, uh, someone's, someone else has built a model of, of this clustering thing. Maybe we want to say which, or each of the clusters is going to vote in a certain way, or assign, we're going to assign a Boolean to each thing in each of the clusters. Could, could, be, could be something more general than that. Okay. So what we might do as an uninformative thing would be to say, for each color, I'm going to pick a random number. Now, this Bernoulli thing is a random Boolean. This, when we take a color as an argument and return Bernoulli, it's a parameterized distribution that given a color produces a random Boolean. But then when we memoize it, it turns it into a random function that assigns to each color a Boolean. Um, so, so we might then use that inside of, oh, sorry, then the whole thing, when we draw from that, sorry, yeah, let's say, this gives us a distribution on functions from colors to Booleans. When we draw from it, we get back a vote assignment, which says, for each color, which, which, which way is that cluster going to vote? Are they going to leave or remain? Are they going to vote Republican or Democrat or whatever? Um, and then that would fit inside a bigger program that involves this random distribution over measures over colors. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a little idea of how you might use stochastic memoization. It's the kind of idea that was motivating this earlier work. Okay, so now let me show you why, you're gonna get a bit technical, why we can't use quasi borel spaces to do that. And then I'll tell you what we could use instead. Okay. So what we wanna have for this particular example is a random function from reals to Booleans, uh, which memoizes this function that assigns a, a random value to every color, or let's say colors are real numbers. And, and then that's where we are. And theorem says there's no such random function in quasi borel spaces. There would be if we'd have had integers here, but as soon as we have an uncountable space here, it's, there's no longer such a random function. Let me show you the proof if that gives a bit of an intuition. So remember a probability measure on a quasi borel space is a function uh, that's allowed from the reals to the space. So a probability measure on the function space should be a, 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 a function that given a seed gives us back a function. Probability measure on the reals is something that given, given a seed gives us a real. A prob probability measure on a function space is something that given a seed gives us back a function. And so in quasi Borel spaces, a, Borel, a, a probability measure on this space of functions, which is where we want to end up, is a Borel function that takes two numbers and re returns either zero or one. So we could plot that as a, you know, a, a zero one valued function on the plane. It might look something like this. So I think it, 
ought to, because for each seed, we're going to get totally random choices for all of the possible real numbers that we could pass into the function. So let's say seeds are on the x-axis. For each seed, we get a whole uncountable number of random choices for each function. That's got to be modulo in the, in the equivalence relation, but let's leave that there. I don't know if this comes across, by the way, across Zoom. It's a, just white noise, basically. Now, when we start building up, by, start calling this memoized function, we start building up a table of all the things that, all, all the random choices that we have for every real number. And what we see is that it behaves in the same way that a graphon would behave. Now, I if you haven't seen graphons, that's fine, but they're basically functions from the, from, uh, from the plane to the unit interval. So rather than going to zero, one, graphons take us into the unit interval. And we know that this gray graph one is the thing that generates the kind of randomness we're talking about. But we wanted something like this black and white graph one. And these two graph ones aren't, cannot be equivalent for any, for any Borel function on the plane. Um, and you can see that by looking at the entropy of graph ones or whatever. So there can be no Borel function from R squared to zero one that behaves in the way that memoization should. And therefore quasi Borel spaces cannot support this kind of memoized function. The graph ones give us a clue into, this, into what I think is a solution to this problem. So let me sketch that out very briefly. Idea, well, let's put to one side for a second the idea of real numbers and let's use nominal sets. And let's talk instead of reals or colors, let's have atoms. After all, the, the colors that we were assigning to clusters were really just names for those clusters and atoms are just as good as a source of names. So let's use nominal sets. Maybe some of you have used nominal sets before. It doesn't matter if you haven't, I'm only gonna talk about this quite briefly. One thing I showed or we showed uh, last year was that graph ones are probability measures, not in quasi Borel spaces, but in nominal sets. Um, you can watch the video, I uh, put the link. We also know that nominal sets are a great place for local memory effects. There's been lots of work on that by myself and by other people. So this seems like a good place to look. By the way, we're not going to, use, if you know about nominal sets, we're not going to use plain atoms. We're going to use atoms with structure, as is used quite a lot by the Warsaw School on nominal automata. In particular, we're going to use uh, where atoms form the vertices of, of, a, of a radiograph or of an infinite bipartite graph. So this is something I'm working on just now with Eunice Kadar. I'm getting some results. I want to get towards a theorem that says that stochastic memorization supports the data flow property, which it seems to uh, do. Um, it, also, other approaches to this have been taken by Hugo Paquette, who's looking at a game semantic model, and Alex Simpson, who's looking at a model based on sheaves on probability spaces, which is a, a, seems a bit different to this approach. Okay, so let me sum up. Uh, we've we've uh, talked mainly at this high level, what kinds of constructions should we have in probabilistic programming and in probability theory? Two things I just wanna say at a high level. First up, the high level structure is abstract. Back in the day, I think, some people thought that real programmers didn't need to use Pascal. They didn't need to use high level languages and constructs. Um, there's always an issue, isn't it? When you're debating what kind of high level structure to have is that you never like really need to use it if you're talking about whole programs and whole things. So the, the, uh, the, the point where it becomes interesting is when it has, I think, a foundational structure to it. It's a fascinating foundational structure, which I think probabilists and statisticians really do appreciate. Um, and also that it has obviously an engineering application for organizing your program well. So all those examples I've seen with laziness, you can truncate, that's fine. Stochastic memoization, you can always unroll your function definitions and, and get rid of it on a whole program. But if we want to talk compositionally about what things are and, and what a high level structure is, I think it's fascinating to, to take that approach. The other thing is I've hardly talked about termination at all. And perhaps if I was talking about random algorithms, I'd have talked about termination a lot. But I think in statistics, there are so many issues to talk about. And maybe that's a difference with traditional FSCD approaches to languages, is that there are so many other issues around. It's not just that we need to understand termination or non-termination, see how that propagates. Just That's just a high level thought. Um, so I'm not saying termination is not relevant. I'm just saying that. Okay, so we've seen these kinds of ideas, types, higher order functions, laziness, stochastic memoization in sort of a programming perspective, but also a semantic perspective as I looked at 
quasi-Borel spaces, Markov categories, these are the semi-Cartesian monoidal categories as an abstract model of probability. And then at the very end, we've touched on nominal sets, which I'm happy to discuss with anybody further. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, the speaker. <laughs> and uh, we... So we have a lot of questions. I know I have, we have a lot of clapping. Okay. <laughs> so we have a time for a few questions that then discussion can continue in the specific uh, room. Yep. So Paul, uh, please. Hi, Paul. Just a minute. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, so I've got a really naive question, um, which is probably not relevant at all. But so I, I find it is um, having heard it, like various talks about semantics of real numbers, which play a, put a big a lot of emphasis on the topology of real numbers. You definitely can't compare real numbers to equality and that kind of thing. Uh, it's obviously then quite jarring to come to this world where where comparing real numbers to equality is considered a perfectly normal thing to do yeah. um is there can you can you say something is there pos is it possible to bring these worlds together is it desirable yeah it's a good question oh, so i've just stopped sharing by accident um let me see if i can share because because i wanted to uh demonstrate uh, right yeah so so i think we've got the um we've got the real numbers coming in as you said as a um uh, because we want to talk about continuity and normal distributions and so on, but they're also playing the role of atoms. When we talk about colors, really the real numbers are playing the role of atoms. So they seem as in nominal sets. So they, where well, you know, atoms are uncountable in nominal sets. So, so th they seem to be playing two roles. And so possibly the way to bring it together is to say that there's two kinds of uncountable thing around. One is atoms. And that's what I was trying to lead towards at the end. And the other is, reals where we think of them maybe as computable um, but because at the moment probabilists and statisticians will write models which are kind of involve maybe this kind of stochastic memoization where we treat real you know we're assigning colors to to um, clusters and thinking of them as things that we want to compare equality on so they are definitely using real numbers in that way where we have equality on them uh, and uh, and also of course in the other way where we're talking about conversions and so on so yeah, my, my feeling is that we should separate these two notions and have atoms and real numbers as, as separate things. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sam, there is a question in the chat for you. Uh, sorry, I lost my chat. There we go. Oh, it's a couple of, uh, so. Shall I may be sufficient, but diff that it may be sufficient, but different ways of generating distributions may lead to different computational complexity and different sampling efficiency. How do you propose to treat sampling efficiency in this framework, or is it out of scope? No, I don't. I don't think it's out of scope at all. Um, I suppose what I've been looking at to start with is the sort of the structure that's there in this semantic formalism. Um, and uh, there's massive questions, of course, about efficiency, convergence of Monte Carlo simulations and Markov chains that, that need to be dealt with. I, I, I hope, sort of hope that they're separate issues, um, but, uh, uh, but that definitely need addressing and crucial in not just in this programming approach, but across statistics, I think. A question on your talk. Well, uh, maybe there will be more. Uh, you pick this nice table uh, with uh, a high level and low level also for the foundations. Yes. You have been discussing about the high level foundations. Right, yeah. What do you see as low level foundation? Yeah, I think low level foundations are things like um, uh, what is a fundamental, so this, I, I tried to say there were two kinds of, of, uh, of uh, thing. Uh, one is the engineering perspective and the other is the sort of more philosophical or mathematical perspective. And from the engineering perspective, I think low level is Monte Carlo simulation, you know, what's a Monte Carlo simulation? And now we don't really care about all the high level stuff. We just want to run the simulation from on you know, a whole program and we get back 
out an answer out of it. And from the philosophical or mathematical point of view, uh, we could talk about what's actually the true foundation of probability, which I think is still something to debate. Is it based on bets, uh, uh, subjective Bayesianism? Is it based on frequencies and so on? And so I think it's fascinating also to try to join up uh, the high level view with the low level view. And that's, if you know De Finetti's theorem, that's what that does. It sort of brings together one high level view on, on probability measures, on, on measure spaces of measures, with a basic uh, philosophical idea about bets. Yeah. So that, that's, that, does that answer the question? Yeah, is that your, uh, I was wondering what you mean by the low level, uh, uh, what yeah. is low level for you? Yeah, so low level would be some just some basic notion of probability over the booleans or over finite spaces or maybe over the real numbers, but not worrying about spaces of stochastic processes and higher order functions and so on. Okay, I think there is a break now, but there is also a room for uh, more discussion or for question uh, that does not, one does not dare to ask publicly to the in front of the whole audience. Okay, thanks. Thank you to everyone. Yep. Thank you, Sam.